Welcome, welcome, welcome to Above Replacement Radio. I am your host, Chris Gianta. I might be becoming a bad baseball fan who can't enjoy the romantic things because of advanced statistics. 15 years from now, I want to be on the early baseball committee. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. I literally have the fan graphs hoodie. The baseball reference t-shirt is repping some stats, you know what I'm saying? It's not necessarily Hall of Fame. It's not necessarily above average, but we can guarantee you we are better than just the standard replacement level college sophomore. And welcome to Above Replacement Radio, where we're talking baseball. Kind of whenever, I'm your host, Chris Gianta. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, I'm doing very well today. I'm uh, I'm just coming off the uh, the in-person Miggy retirement tour. I was, I was lucky enough to be in Detroit on Thursday to watch what will be his fourth to last game uh, as a Major League Baseball player. Um, and we'll get more into him specifically probably next show because he's still got two more games. But uh, yeah, the Miggy retirement tour is alive and well. I mean, Detroit is the, Detroit's pretty much all in on, at this point because as soon as you like drive into the city, there's billboards, there's like signs on buildings, there's everything saying like "Thank you, Miggy," like come celebrate Miguel Cabrera his last games. Um, yeah, the city's the city's been in Miggy mode for the last, at least you know definitely this week, but I'm sure the last like month or so. Yeah, I mean, uh, makes a lot of sense. The guy's been with the organization for 17 years, giving them a lot of uh, good memories, you know, two MVPs and, you know, a large part of, uh, m- you know, those playoff runs that they had in the early 2010s. So, yeah, I mean, they they definitely have a lot to be thankful for. So it's good to see them, you know, reciprocate there. Um, but and more importantly, you got to see Cole Reagans and Sawyer Gibson yes. on face yeah, each dude. other. <laughs> It's it was crazy because like I sent you I sent you like the meme of like yeah nothing says baseball nerd like guy in a fan graph study like rushing over to the Royals bullpen before a game because Cole Reagans is about to start warming up and that's exactly what I was doing and I uh, like you know I know that I uh, people talk about how Fenway like at Fenway the you know the stands are very close to the bullpen it's like the same in Detroit it's like maybe even closer. You get very close to the players in Detroit, like watching their bullpen. Yeah, which is interesting for a stadium that was built like in the last twenty years or so. I forget, ex- yeah. I forget the exact year, but it's a fairly recent stadium. Yeah, like I was standing probably less than ten feet away from Cole Reagans when he was warming up. Yeah, it's very interesting. I guess they just trust you know those Midwesterners over yeah. in Michigan a lot yeah. more than than uh, over on the Northeast. Um, like I'm, I'm imagining like the day that Justin Verlander like returned to Detroit, or like any day that he even started for the Tigers, like how packed it must have been over there. Like it yeah. was probably crazy. Yeah, I mean it's a or great. Like if, or like if Shohei pitches in Detroit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it seems like, yeah, it seem it seems like it would get like pretty pretty hectic over there. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's it. You did send me that picture, and it was it was yeah, yeah it on. was pretty absurdly close. Yeah, um, I have a video I could send as well, but I took it in like the cinematic mode, so it's a yeah. massive file. Yeah, it'll 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 go into the show. Um, yeah. so, <clears throat> so yeah, so Daniel went to Comerica Park. Obviously, that was the only thing he was doing. He just drove to Comerica Park. Uh, yeah. Yep. No, no other, uh, no other Midwest uh, activities going on, but um, he's back. And in the in the time, I think <clears throat> probably on the drive back for you, or maybe even after you got back, uh, there was major news coming out of San Francisco, in which Gabe Kapler, the uh, manager for the Giants since the start of 2020, uh, he was, uh, you know removed of his duties uh he is fired as manager of the san francisco giants uh what were your what were your thoughts on this one yeah that this news actually came out like an, maybe an hour and a half after i finished the seven hour drive yesterday um i was about to take a nap and then i was you know i got past the notification it kept me up for another like 10 minutes kind of just thinking about it but uh it's gabe kapler is such a weird uh, manager to kind of assess because um 
first of all, he's extremely handsome. I mean, I think that's the that's the number one pick that that everyone agrees on. So obviously, he's a great manager. Um, but you know, when you look at his record, he manages teams that are right around five hundred pretty much every year except for twenty twenty one when he out of nowhere managed a one hundred seven win team. Um, and you look at the teams that he's managed. You look at the rosters. You know, it was the late twenty ten Phillies, uh, kind of pre Harper. It was the uh, and also in the Harper era as well, but it was that, and it was you know the uh, the Giants in the like kind of post Buster Posey, but also end of Buster Posey era. Um, you know, there's not. I don't think there's ever been a team, ever been a Giants team outside of maybe 2022, where preseason people were thinking this has to be a playoff team. Uh, and I mean, Gabe Kapler. Yeah, you mentioned this before the show when you look at the Giants' record this year. It looks about like they performed around the expectation, but they are they have lost a lot of games recently. Yeah, it, it's you know it, it's interesting to look at from from all angles because yeah you look at it from the perspective that I think they're at, at the time that he was fired they were seventy eight and eighty one. Um, I forgot if they won or lost yesterday because uh, these stats might be um might be outdated, but I, I should check what they did last night because I wasn't really paying attention. They, you know, their games are no longer very relevant. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. They lost last night. So, so heading into the firing, they had lost 31 of their previous 48, like 17 and 31. Um, I think, you know, in at least their last 49 games, including after he got fired, they have the third worst record in baseball. So, maybe they're firing him based off of how the team finished. But if you're looking at it overall, like this team being 78 and 81, when he was fired, that's kind of where a lot of people expected them to be. That's where we expected them to be. You expected them as a fourth place team. I had them as a third place team. Um, We did not really, and either way, we we didn't have them in the playoffs. Uh, You know, we thought, you know, it was, unfortunate misses in the free agent market with Carlos Correa and Aaron judge. And they weren't in, you know, letting go of Carlos Rodon, you know, mind you, he, he hasn't, he hasn't performed since he got no. signed, but, you know, last year he was one of the best pitchers in baseball. So we didn't really expect much. They kind of performed how they were supposed to. And, and, you know, he's, he's getting fired here. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but a few weeks ago, Tom Verducci wrote an article saying that the Giants were like maybe the most boring postseason contender of all time. And I kind of hate to agree with it because it's such an extreme thing to say. But like, let's be honest with ourselves. So the Giants made the postseason. Who are we like excited to watch outside of some guys in the bullpen and Logan Webb? And for us, because we're nerds, Alex Cobb. Yeah, no. Nah. Yeah, no, it like, like Logan Webb would be the premier bat, guy to watch. Yeah, like their best bat this year has been Wilmer Flores, which no disrespect to him, he's been, you know, he's been very good this year. But when you think about playoff games and you think about the guys that, you know, you don't want to face the playoffs, if Wilmer Flores is the number one guy, it doesn't feel like it's the, the best team in the world. And that's kind of, I think, how a lot of people feel about the Giants. And, you know, I mean, I think it kind of speaks to the roster that, uh, Gabe Kapler was given this year. You know, they were hoping to get Aaron Judge, Carlos Correa. They got neither. Um, and they just never really had a guy that they could build around on the, in that offense this year. And I think it kind of showed. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I think, in our opinions, like he was given an average situation and the team produced average results. And, you know, maybe, maybe the, you know, the front office is expecting more, but that's, he was kind of he kind of was dealt the the hand that you know that the front office or you know just basic luck gave him uh you know here you know this is the top five or top five or top six highest paid players on the giants this year it goes in order jock peterson michael conforto alex wood anthony desclafani sean Manaya, and ross stripling and this is not you know a low budget team. This is the San Francisco Giants. It's a very, this is a very, you know, big market team. And, you know, their, their highest paid guys are Jock Peterson and Michael Conforto. Like, 
they're they're not putting themselves in a situation where they need to be taken seriously as a playoff contender just from a organizational standpoint at least for this year you know they may be set up you know with financial flexibility and a good system they may be set up for you know the next couple years or something like that but yeah i i don't know it it just seems like i don't know if he's i don't think he's necessarily getting fired for failing or maybe maybe it's just like the front office thinks they're going in a new direction after this year and they want the right guy for it. They, they weren't very active at the trade deadline. Um, they have a team of major league players, but it's not a good enough team to make it to the playoffs and their our farm system. They have some guys, but it's not like stellar by any means, but they also don't really have guys that, that you're thinking they can let go of in the off season because like, you know, they've already extended Logan Webb. And even then you don't want to trade Logan Webb. Uh, all of their, you know, producers are on the wrong side of 30. Um, if you look at their, if you look at their like main, uh, you know, if you look at their main starting lineup from this year, it's like, uh, you know, JD Davis is 30, Mitch Hanniger's 32, Michael Conforto's 30, Jock Peterson's 31. Lamont Wade Jr. is going to be 30 next year. Um, Mikey Stremski is 32. Wilmer Flores is 31. Uh, they have a very weird team. I think it's going to be interesting to see what direction this team goes in. But, um, you know, I guess Gabe Kapler was the guy that had to take the fall this year. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, I, I just think they've been in bridge, you know, they're, they're in bridge mode right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like they had a, you know, the 2021 is one of the biggest anomalies in baseball history like mm. with what they what they did uh it's pretty crazy and then you know last year they regressed to the mean to uh you know to a lower level and yeah this year like they they added they added some supplemental pieces but they didn't get who they wanted they lost carlos rodon in free agency who you know i know he's been absolutely horrible this year but he was one of the best pitchers in baseball last year and it would have been nice for the giants to keep him around and you know maybe maybe fate has it where he doesn't you know start the year injured in san francisco and he actually has a good year over there but i don't know uh <clears throat> and you know never mind the fact that they also lost you know kevin gosman in free agency uh two years ago and you know didn't seem to really be too competitive with the offers there so um yeah, they just haven't made much of a big splash. Like there hasn't been, there hasn't really been a move in a, in over half a decade from the Giants where you're like, wow, I can't believe they did that. Like this is really going to change the team. They just haven't really had that. Yeah, I'm trying to think back to the last time. I mean, like they had their chances last, you know, year with, with like I mentioned, Correa and, and Judge. And obviously both of those just completely fell through. Um, very. I think the the biggest wow move. This wasn't a free agent move, but like trading for Chris Bryant. Yeah. Right. That's kind of it. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It was. Um, it yeah. was nice for you know middle of the season. And yeah, as far as off season moves, it's been since like maybe Johnny Cueto or something like that. Um, yeah. So they've been kind of bridging, and you know. I'm not, you know, we're we're not on the inside, so we don't know exactly uh, how much things are a fault on the roster, how, how much things are a fault on on management, because, you know, they did have a, a bit of a collapse toward the end. They were, you know, comfortably in like the fifth seed in the NL playoff picture and then just, you know, kind of fell apart. Um, and also, you know, they have a new core sort of emerging coming up, guys like Patrick Bailey, uh, Kyle Harrison and. Uh, Marco Luciano and along with you know guys that have already been established like Logan Webb and maybe maybe the front office wants a new manager for an emerging core yeah it's uh yeah I mean it's I think they had to choose between Farhan Zaidi who's one of the most well-known established executives in baseball they had to choose between Gabe Kapler and something else and you know I think that's what they went with um so I don't know. I like like I said, I don't know what direction this team is in right now. It's kind of hard to predict what they what they do from here. Um, yeah, I think that they have one of the most unpredictable off seasons ahead right now of all teams in the, in the league right now. Yeah, I think I think there's a decent amount of pressure to make a big move, considering you know the the two 
the two duds they had last year and along with the fact that you know i think they only spent um according to baseball reference they only spent i think like a hundred forty six million dollars on their team um which is very low for them like this is a team especially you know in the year 2023 like you'd expect them to be spending around 200 million even more on their team so um you know i wouldn't be surprised to see them in on a big starting pitcher um, even like, I don't know, I, I have no idea what the Shohei Otani sweepstakes are going to be, but the Giants could be in that. So who knows? Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. Anything more on the Kapler firing? No, I think I mean, I think he'll find another job. You know, maybe like maybe it's not a manager. I think he could get another manager job immediately. Um, you know, Cleveland's going to be looking for a new manager because Terry Francona is out. Uh, there are, I'm sure, some other teams that will fire their managers in the coming days after this season. Uh, but we'll we'll have to see. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I think I think he'll I I think he'll get at least a managerial interview this winter somewhere. Yeah, I I could see that happening. I mean, I think he's built a a decent enough track record to you know be seen as someone who at least like even even if there's an organization that's looking to you know just maintain for a little bit and not collapse, uh maybe maybe they'll they'll look for him to uh you know mend the fence there uh so yeah so the giants you know pretty much yeah i think completely out of the wild card race they're you know eliminated and that wild card race has had quite a quite a bit of shake up since since you know august and and even in the last week uh you know the the chicago cubs have gone from in a playoff spot to uh one and a half games out of a playoff spot the marlins are now comfortably uh, in the sixth seed in the National League playoff picture, could clinch today with a win and a Cubs loss, or I think just straight up a, or would they would they clinch with a straight up win? Um, I believe, I don't know. Hold on, let me is check. MLB. Yeah, wrote a very MLB.com wrote a very helpful article today explaining the uh the clinch situations. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it is win against the Pirates or or both Cubs and Reds lose. They could they could clinch with just a win today. That is crazy. Yeah. Um. Pretty unbelievable. Yeah. It's it's been quite the shakeup. Like, what have you been thinking about this whole this whole past week of of baseball here? So the Marlins actually have like one of the nicest situations ever because their magic number to clinch is one. And let's say they they lose these two against the uh the Pirates. They go back to New York on Monday and finish up that two to one game against the Mets. That's in the ninth inning right now. Um, they basically just have to go into New York and get three outs, and they're in the playoffs, which is a very funny situation. I'd also be very curious to see how many people show up to City Field that day. Yeah, I mean, if 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 that <laughs> game ends up being played, like it it picks up in the ninth inning, it would be the last day of the season. The Mets are down one. I'm I'm like close enough. I'd almost. Be cur- I'd almost want to go. You'd almost just go. Yeah. I, yeah. Honestly, fair enough. I got I got family in New York. I could visit <laughs> for a, I, mean, I could visit for an hour or two and go to a Mets go to a Mets inning, not a game. <laughs> go to a Mets inning. <laughs> um, not only that, but like the last inning of the year too. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> um, I don't know. it sounds like a very. Uh, what are are tickets like available? Yeah. Or, like, I'm is not it sure. like you had to have had a ticket? Because it's not even a guarantee that that game gets played. Like if the Marlins, like if the Marlins playoff seed is confirmed, uh, like before, it, I don't see tickets available. By the way, but if the Marlins like have, um, like their seed already determined on Sunday, there's no real reason to do it. Right. Uh, th- I'm not seeing a. I'm I think not... what would most likely be in their way is the fact that the, like Diamondbacks could be close within them and mm-hmm. they might have to play to determine whether they're a five or a six seed. Yeah. Um, That's probably the most likely scenario, but yeah, they just have to win one game against the pirates. Yeah. And then, and then they go, they go to city field and they intentionally walk eight batters to face the brewers instead of the Phillies. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So, they bring so, yeah. up like they they literally bring out like a fan from the fans to just have the catcher do like the do like the signal to first base eight times in a row. Yeah, like, right, there's right, not right. a pitch thrown. 
Yeah, it, but there's like, you know what, man, you want you want to be a, on a major league baseball team. Here you go. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, the uh, the Marlins have been doing well. The Cubs have not. The Cubs have lost four in a row. Um, you know, when we outlooked what they were doing, we knew that last week of schedule was probably going to be tough for them. You know, they faced they had three against the Braves and now they have three against the Brewers. And although both have, you know, clinched their divisions, they've been tough competition. And it's been noted as the Cubs have lost four in a row. And uh, it's it's been it's yeah, it's it's just been rough to see. I've been watching most of the Cubs games and yeah. they've had leads in a lot of them and have not been able to follow through. In fact, uh, since Tuesday, which is when this four-game losing streak started, Cubs pitchers have the lowest win probability added in baseball. They're at minus 1.65, and the uh, next worst is minus 0.91. So they're almost a full win uh, worse than the next worst win probability added among pitchers. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's They've lost some heartbreaking games. They had that game where Seiya Suzuki dropped the ball against uh, the Braves. They've been walked off multiple times. They lost the Brewers last night after coming back in the ninth inning. Um, they didn't get the you know the the, go, the ghost runner home in the tenth inning. And yeah, it's been quite the fall from grace from them. They were they looked like the safest playoff team uh, in the league. You know, a few like, like a few weeks ago, even last week. Um, and things have kind of just fallen apart. It's giving me real like 2019 vibes. Yeah, yeah, I, th- that's kind of the parallel you can you can draw there. Is you know, I I was actually looking at it yesterday. Back in 2019, they were a game up on the Brewers for the um for that last wild card spot, and then lost nine in a row and just basically fell out of it. Um, and a lot of that also had to do with you know clutch pitching. They didn't have it at that point. They didn't have it. Yeah. Uh, here unable to close out games unfortunately and that's not also also not all necessarily on pitching is you know i mean say a suzuki unfortunately was unable to retrieve that ball and likely you know if he catches that they probably win that game it, you know they could have they could have blown it in the ninth but you know it, it did not make things easier on them whatsoever so here they are a game a game and a half out and you know all the, all they can all they can do is you know, try to regroup and win and keep the season alive. But uh, it looks bleak when the Marlins are out there playing the Pirates and Marlins seem to be doing the opposite of what the Cubs are doing and just coming through in like all clutch situations. Not only that, but I feel like I don't know if this really exists, but like the Pirates, you know, like I don't know if you saw this, but the Pirates and Cubs played each other last week and the Pirates played spoiler. They took two out of three. And David Ross had a quote after the game that said, like, yeah, the Pirates aren't a good team. We shouldn't be losing to them. If you're the Pirates and you can spoil the Cubs' playoff hopes by simply losing, might as well. Yeah, like, right. If, they, if, they're, if they're taking that comment to heart, it's like, oh, we're not a good team. We'll ruin your playoff chances. We already did it against you guys, and we'll let the team ahead of you go right on ahead. We'll roll over against them if we have to. Because not only that, but that also will eliminate the Reds. Uh, so that would be you know, two different division opponents that the Pirates have an opportunity to play spoiler against by losing. Which right. I don't know. I don't know if, you know, a lot of the players or the managers are really in the business to do that. I don't know if they care. It's possible they don't, and that's fine. But if they really want to be petty, they could. Yeah, they absolutely could. Um, And yeah, I, I don't know if it would be the players necessarily doing it. Maybe management, you know, makes some decisions. It's like a... Uh, it's like that the Yankees in 2011 where like yeah. they, blew, they blew that seven nothing lead to kick the Red Sox out of the playoffs in game 162 against the Rays. Yeah. Although I, you know, not to go on a super tangent, but it, it wouldn't have, <clears throat> I don't think it would have been a wise choice if they intentionally blew that lead. Cause the Red Sox were so ice cold that if they made the playoffs, they were going to get torched by, you know, whoever, whoever, no, but it's the whole, it's the whole rivalry thing. Yeah, it's the rivalry. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Um yeah, yeah, no. I, like there maybe there's something there. Um as far as the Marlins go, <clears throat> since uh Saturday, they have the fourth most win probability added as an offense. They are coming through in high leverage situations. I'm trying to look at uh like splits leaderboards to see where they rank 
in specific like high leverage situations because yeah last night they were down three nothing against the pirates uh they kind of chip away and then eventually in the eighth inning uh tie it and and eventually take that lead and you know they, they just like you know it, maybe it translate translates in the postseason but they seem to just be winning the big moments right now yeah i mean they're finding a way uh, every single time they were down three to nothing to the pirates last night they scored four runs in the eighth and won four to three um you know they came back against the mets in that suspended game they were losing one to nothing they scored two and then the rain delay started um which which sets up the amazing ninth inning that is upcoming on a on monday if possible i really hope that game gets played just because i want to see what that looks like it, yeah it would be it would be quite something i i just although um it, it feels like it should be like raining as well but it, i think the forecast has it for good weather yeah, no but, that that like just based on vibes like that's a rainy day yes it's a it's a it's like a cloudy overcast 60 62 degree day yeah um, with 47 fans in attendance yeah exactly exactly um but yeah, I I feel like, I feel like that could happen depending on what the Diamondbacks do over the over the next weekend. By the way, speaking of games early next week, did you see that the Braves are going to be playing like simulated playoff games, like with Truist Park open to prepare for the NLDS? I did not see that. No. Yeah, it's very fun. I think so. I think they're playing like an inner squad scrimmage or whatever. I don't really know like who they're going to have pitch. Like, are they going to have Strider pitch in this? Probably not. Maybe I don't know. Maybe they'll throw like fifty pitches. Um, like a bullpen type thing, but they're opening it up to the fans and they're trying to like, you know, because last year they lost in the NLDS to the Phillies when they had that long break. Uh, and I think they're kind of trying to account for that this year, which maybe it'll be really smart. Maybe it'll be kind of a meme. I, it'd be really funny if like Acuna just goes off and he's like so, showing a ton of emotion after homering off of Charlie Morton. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a 550 foot home run. Yeah. Yeah, right. It breaks a stat cast record, but it doesn't count. Yeah, there's there's still forty five thousand people there. They're all they're all <laughs> they're doing the punched. chop. Yeah. Yeah, they <laughs> Joe Jimenez is coming out of the bullpen and the lights are just all are all uh going yeah. off, off and on. They they bring back like yeah, they have like Chipper Jones throwing out the first pitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think and they bring back like Dale Murphy, like Warren Spawn. Yeah, I don't, gonna, I don't think they're gonna bring back Warren Spawn. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, that's that's the ideal. That's the ideal scenario. Yeah. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> Somehow they bring back like Kid Nichols. Yeah, <laughs> they just bring back. Yeah, they bring like John Clarkson. They bring like Charlie Buffington's like great great grandson, <laughs> and he throws out the first pitch. <laughs> Yeah, who who threw who had a, like a twenty war season on a in a different city? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That'd be um, extremely fun. So, so yeah, uh, for the simulated playoff game, right? Um, in the AL, it is it is also a bit hectic as the Mariners have gotten back into things. They are a game out in the playoff race, but also their wins are even more significant to the playoff race because they are losses for Texas who yep. are now, you know, after, you know, we were talking about them in our last episode, they were two and a half games up in the AL West. Now they're only a game up in the AL West. And I believe if they tie with the Astros, you know, they lose the tiebreaker. They've, they yeah. have a losing record against the Astros. So big things so, there. I mean, what are we thinking about just the general AL AL playoff picture right now? So this division's a mess, so I'll just break it down as best I can real quick. So the Astros, so it, the really tough thing is that there's no game 163s anymore, but also I don't know how they do it because there's a legitimate possibility that this, this division ends in a three-way tie if the Mariners win both of these next two games and the Astros uh, go one and one against the Diamondbacks. But the Astros have the tiebreaker against the Rangers, the Rangers have the tiebreaker against the Mariners, and the Mariners have the tiebreaker against the Astros. So it's like a rock, paper, scissors situation where, you know, every team has one win and one loss against uh, against each other in terms of the tiebreakers. Um, the Mariners are such an, in such a weird spot because they could win the division, they could 
uh, win, make a wild card spot, or they could miss the playoffs. And as it stands right now, they would miss the playoffs. Uh, they could win out and still miss the playoffs because the Astros would have to uh, lose one for them to get in. Uh, if they end up tied with the Rangers exclusively, the Rangers have that tiebreaker. Um, but I guess if there's a three-way tie, they give it to the Mariners. That's what I've heard. I'm not exactly sure what the tiebreaker is there. But from what I've been told, uh, the Mariners would win the division in the in the event of a three-way tie. And I guess the Rangers would probably miss the playoffs. Yeah, that, it, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, it puts a lot of pressure on the Rangers after they had a big series um, over the last weekend. And it seemed like, you know, it was destined for them to win that division. And now, you know, they had a good series against the Angels, but, you know, now two losses in a row against the Mariners, one of them, uh, one of which was, you know, they were up 2-1 in the ninth and, and and lost it. So, yeah, a lot of pressure on them. As far as pitching matchups go, I've, I'm not sure uh, exactly who they are throwing out there. Um, but it's going to be really interesting to see what the Mariners and Rangers do. Uh, I think we said, uh, we said a couple episodes ago, like a lot of, a lot of the just general AL, AL playoff picture is going to depend on what these Mariners and how these Mariners Rangers series turn out. And it's, it's looking like it because it could determine the AL West. It could determine the sixth seed. It could determine the fifth seed in the American league playoff picture. Like there is a lot writing on these next two games here. Okay, so real quick, I'm trying to read for the, uh, I'm trying to figure out the AL West scenario, um, like the, the division. Yeah. MLB. It looks like MLB.com wrote an article about it uh, earlier today. And as far as pitching matchups the Rangers, go. Yeah. It's, it's Andrew Heaney versus Luis Castillo today, and the Mariners crushed uh, Andrew Heaney. Yeah. And then uh, Mariners have George Kirby going on Sunday with TBD for the Rangers. As a result of the tiebreaker, in assuming the, the three the three team tie in the American League West, uh, would go to the Mariners because they have a better combined winning percentage against the other two teams. Interesting. Okay. It seems like yeah. they have things sorted out over there. At Which is weird because they're only like three and eight against the Rangers. Yeah. I think the Rangers. Yeah, they're well. The Rangers kind of tanked it against the Astros. They are, but they are nine and four against the Astros. Or yeah, against the Astros. Okay. Yeah. So it's so interesting. yeah, very interesting. So this is you know all of this would assume would be under the assumption that the Mariners win both games against the Rangers, uh, and the Astros lose one because the as if the Astros sweep, uh, the Diamondbacks like the 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 Mariners are out. Uh, and that kind of eliminates a lot of the chaos. But the Diamondbacks also need to win too. Like they have not clinched the playoff spot yet. Um, and I know they can clinch on the basis of other teams losing, but I think they want to clinch today and get a win. And it isn't the most favorable matchup for them today. It's uh, is Justin Verlander versus Merrill Kelly. Merrill Kelly has been solid, but you know, I mean, you're facing Verlander. Like it's not going to be easy. And neither team has announced a starter for tomorrow. Um, so yeah, it's going to be interesting between those two. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm I'm really and excited the, to watch. Yeah. Lay and back on the couch. And also in all this, there's the Blue Jays who like also are a part of this. They have not clinched the playoff spot, but they could have to today with a win against the Rays, who already have their fate decided. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have any competitive reason to play. Um. Yeah. Blue Jays have been kind of. You know they've been all right. They they lost a couple games to the Yankees, but uh, won last night against the Rays. You know I think won that series against the Rays last weekend. So putting themselves in a decent enough position. You know much of the much of their fate is in their own hands. So um, it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, they could blow it. <laughs> they for, could. They could hypothetically blow it. I forget. Um, Who's who has the tiebreaker on? between them and the Mariners? Uh, I'm assuming the Blue Jays. Do? I think Blue Jays they... are four and three against the Astros. They are three and three against Seattle. So who oh, knows man. how that gets sorted out? I don't know if it's run differential, but Seattle scored twenty seven runs against the Blue Jays, and Toronto scored twenty six. If that's <laughs> yep. the uh, if that's the tiebreaker, 
Yeah. And then uh, Texas. Yeah, the Blue Jays were one and six against them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow, that is a, that is so much fun, and there's so much chaos, and it's God, it sucks that there's no game one sixty threes anymore because that would be so much fun, even though it would probably push the postseason back. Yeah, realistically, probably it would. Like, what would they do? Yeah, what would they do in a three team tie in the ALS? Like, they they can't just like play around Robin. Yeah, no. Like, all right, every everyone meet in like Texas. Like, we're gonna have the Astros play the Rangers, and the Rangers play the Mariners, and the Mariners play the Astros. Back in uh, back in the fifties, they had I think it was like this charity game or something, but they had a three team baseball game with the Giants, Dodgers, and Yankees. And uh, maybe maybe they yeah. would maybe they would try that. I forget. I think would, one they, would team, they would they drive from ballpark to ballpark? It was <laughs> it was like uh, it was like one team was on the bench, one team hit, and one team uh was in the field, and then they would like rotate through <laughs> that. It's That's really so much interesting. Fun. That is so much fun. So it's yeah. like it's so it's like so like there's the top, the middle, and the bottom of each inning. It's yeah. It seems like it. But the middle isn't just between inning. It's it's just quite literally like no, it's the middle part of the inning actually. Yeah, I try cornered baseball game. Um, nineteen forty four Polo Grounds. Uh, the try cornered baseball game was a three-way exhibition baseball game held at the Polo Grounds on June 26, 1944, among the Brooklyn Dodgers, New York Giants, and New York Yankees. The game, a World War II fundraiser, was played with a round-robin format, in which each team batted and fielded during six innings and rested for the other three. The Dodgers won by scoring five runs in their times at bat. The Yankees scored one run, while the Giants were unable to score. So it's so much fun. So you so like pitching doesn't really matter. You just have to like it doesn't matter how many runs you give up. You just have to score the most. Um, I guess. But in, in that case, you want to allow the least. You know, you don't. You want to make sure. Maybe, maybe the, they go by run differential. Well, you want you want to make sure that the what that when you're pitching against, you know, if 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 this were to play out among the Rangers, Mariners, and uh, yeah. and Astros, if you're the Rangers, you want to make sure the Astros aren't scoring. You want you want to do well against them so that the Astros don't have more runs than you. Yep. Imagine like it's the last inning and like the Rangers have like pretty much already clinched it. And they're like, you know, and it's like between the Mariners and Astros and the Mariners are batting and they're like, you know what? Like we don't want our, our in-state rival to make it. So they just tank the last inning. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> very possible. It's very, very possible. Yeah. It's just um, the playoffs because of that. So, so yeah, there there's always that, but um, there will be none of that because there is no, there are, it's all determined through, uh, other tiebreakers. No, th- no three way baseball games, unfortunately, this year. Um, but I can, you know, we can cam- campaign for it here. Yeah. Um, anything more on the playoff races? Playoff races? It's 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 a mess, but it's gonna be very fun over the next two days. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm glad I don't really have too many responsibilities over the next couple days um and just am able to have you know many screens up many many baseball games going on Mm -hmm. i think yeah there's a possibility that all of this could be irrelevant tomorrow um maybe maybe i'm wrong on that but i'm sure there'll be something that matters yeah like maybe maybe there's a lot of things that get wrapped up today but like maybe there's one or two things either way like i know i'll be watching the tigers on sunday True, 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 true. Yeah. You gotta watch the last of Miguel Cabrera. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yep. And yeah, they have the thing where it's every single game starts at the same time. Yep. Three o'clock. So yeah, it'll be it'll be fun. Um, all right. Anything more before we get into players to highlight? No, let's do it. All right, now we will get into our Saturday, September 30, 2023 edition of How About That. He's striking out less, walking more, and he's also making better contact. Turning into a strikeout machine just out of nowhere. He's been excellent all around this year. He is getting a... How about that? So for my how about that today, I'm looking at a guy on a team that's, you know, in the playoff race. Their chances of actually making it are pretty slim, but this guy has played a big role for them in the month of September, and that is Christian Encarnacion Strand of the um, Cincinnati Reds. Since September 5th, he is slashing 333, 379, 722 for an 1102 OPS, uh, giving him a 193 weighted runs created plus. 
And that 193 weighted runs created plus ranks ninth highest in the majors. And his eight home runs in the span are tied for the fourth most in the majors. So he's been one of the best power hitters in all of baseball in September. Uh, throughout the span, he has a fly ball rate of 41.9%. That is the ninth highest rate among the 312 hitters with at least 25 batted balls. Um, his average exit velocity on fly balls has also gone from 91.9 miles per hour before the span to 96.8 miles per hour in this span. So he's hitting a lot of fly balls and he's hitting them hard. Uh, that average exit velocity on fly balls ranks tied for 24th among the 214 hitters with at least 10 fly balls. Uh, additionally, since September 15th, he has an 18.6% ground ball rate, which is the second lowest among the uh, 204 hitters with at least 25 batted balls in that span. Uh, the pitches the pitches that he has dominated the most are four-seamers, curveballs, and sliders. And uh, against those pitches, he is hitting 395 with an 868 slugging percentage in this span. And that average ranks seventh and slugging ranks fourth among the 282 hitters with at least 25 plate appearances ending on such pitches. So Christian Encarnacion Strand, he's a rookie this year, but he's really made a big impact for the Reds when it's mattered. Yeah, Christian Encarnacion Strand. How about that? Um, part of the Tyler Molle trade yep. uh, at the 2022 trade deadline. Um, for my how about that, I am staying in the same division, and you know this is the this is the last um players to highlight segment where we are able to talk about teams that aren't talk about players on teams that aren't going to the playoffs for sure. Um, you know, for our last editions of How About That and Slightly Alarmings, we um we do teams that are in the playoffs because otherwise it's not that relevant. Um, but uh, I'm taking advantage of the opportunity and I'm talking about a pirate with a man by the name of Jared Triolo. Uh, I was very pretty... curious to see if you would uh bypass the Babip. Um, yeah, well, it's it's pretty it's pretty absurd, like how he's he's gotten there and you know we'll get into why you know i I think part you know part of it makes sense that he has such a high babip um so just breaking it down jared triolo in his last 11 games is hitting 486 with a 1425 ops uh 1425 ops is absolutely absurd that is better than uh the best ops in a season ever um out of 172 qualifying hitters in the span Jared Triolo's average ranks second, on base percentage ranks third, slugging ranks fourth, and OPS ranks third. And out of 147 hitters with 150 plus pitches seen in this span, his expected batting average ranks ninth, expected slugging ranks ninth, and expected WOBA ranks sixth. So those expected numbers are also among the top in the league. Um, and he has seen he has seen some dramatic differences. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. His Average exit velocity has gone from 85.1 miles per hour before the span to 92.0 miles per hour in the span. And out of 147 hitters, his average exit velocity ranks 24th. His ground ball rate has gone from 45% before the span to 30% in the span. And out of 151 hitters with 25 plus batted balls in the span, his ground ball rate is 11th lowest. And partially why his uh, BABIP is so high is his sweet spot rate is up. That's line drives, that's fly balls. Uh, his sweet spot rate has gone from 36% before the span, which is already good, to an elite 52% in the span. That sweet spot rate ranks third out of 151. Uh, along with that, his fly ball rate has gone from 19% to 37%. And that fly ball rate ranks 13th out of 151 uh, within the top 10 percent uh yeah top 10 percent there and just his total line drive slash fly ball rate percentage of batted balls that are either line drives or fly balls is 70 percent in the span which ranks fourth out of 151 and his average exit velocity on fly balls has gone from 86.8 miles per hour to 97.1 miles per hour and he has gone from slugging 125 on fly balls you know a measly 125 on fly balls to slugging 1,600 on them in this span, this 11-game span, he's slugging 1,600 on fly balls. And, uh, you know, with the average exit velocity going up on those fly balls, his barrel rate has gone from 2% before the span to 19% in this span. And that barrel rate 
ranks 13th out of 151. Uh, and along with him making uh, great contact, hitting it at really ideal launch angles and hitting the ball way harder. He's also just generally hitting the ball more. His strikeout rate has gone from 31% before the span to 22% in the span. And he is also seeing the ball better as his walk rate has gone from 9% to 20%. And out of 172 qualifier, qualifying hitters in the span, his walk rate ranks ninth. Uh, so Jared Triolo has seen a dramatic difference in average exit velocity, sweet spot rate, line drive slash fly ball rate. Uh, you know, those two kind of go in the same and a dramatic decrease in strikeouts and a dramatic increase in walks. Uh, and he's been, a, you know, a sight to see over there in Pittsburgh, resulting in a 1425 OPS in 11 games. It's pretty, been pretty unbelievable. He's getting a. How about that? And now we will go from the highs to the lows where we're talking uh, players and subjects that have been underperforming with our Saturday, September 30th, 2023 edition of Slightly Alarming Statistics. He's been barreling up the ball way less. But he's not missing bats. He's not getting the ball on the ground, and people are hitting it in the air more. It's been so bad. He is getting a... Slightly alarming. Yeah, so for my slightly alarming, I'm talking about uh, a guy that's on a playoff hopeful team that, uh, you know, they haven't been getting the right contributions from in this span. Uh, Nathaniel Lowe from the Texas Rangers has been really struggling lately. Since September 15th, he's slashing 094, 186, 170, for a 356 weighted OPS and a negative three weighted runs created plus, along with a negative 0.7 F4. His slugging percentage ranks second worst in this span, and every other stat that I just mentioned ranks dead last among the 177 qualifiers. Uh, during this span, he has a ground ball rate of 57.9%. That is tied for the 20th highest among the 204 hitters with at least 25 batted balls in this span. And on a similar note, 44.7% of his balls have been zero degrees or lower. So he's hitting the ball on the ground, punching it into the ground a lot. Um, Nathaniel Lowe has actually always been kind of a high-ish ground ball rate guy, but this is a much more extreme example. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, he has a 10.5% fly ball rate in this span. That is the third lowest on that same list of 204. I don't really have a ton on him today, but, uh, you know, the Rangers obviously need to get more production out of their first baseman uh, if they want to clinch one of these last two playoff spots in the American League, or three, I should say. Yeah, Nathaniel Lowe. Slightly alarming. Yeah, I was I was noticing him, you know, at the at the bottom of those uh leaderboards and whatnot. It's it's pretty uh pretty stark. Um mm-hmm. my slightly alarming is from a different uh AL West playoff hopeful. And he was really, really hot like a few weeks ago and now has recorrected in a major way uh and regressed way way down to the mean and i'm talking about teoscar hernandez of the seattle mariners uh in his last 19 games he is hitting 176 with a 483 ops uh out of 165 qualifying hitters in the span teoscar hernandez's slugging is third lowest and ops is fourth lowest uh the slugging being third lowest is pretty alarming considering he you know gets a lot of offense production from his power uh, and out of 53 hitters with 300 plus pitches seen in the span, his expected batting average is second lowest, expected woba is second lowest, and expected slugging is the lowest. Uh, also, he has a 37% strikeout rate in the span, which is fifth highest out of 165. Uh, part of this has to do with uh, how often he's swinging and missing. His whiff rate has gone from 35% before the span to 45% in the span. And out of 204 hitters with 100 plus swings in the span, Teoscar Hernandez's whiff rate is the highest in baseball. And his whiff rate on four seam fastballs particularly have gone from <clears throat> has gone from 32% to 53%. And out of 264 hitters to swing at 25 plus four seamers, his whiff rate on four seamers is the highest, Uh, you know, hitter, you know, just in general, the league swings and misses on four seamers less, but that is not the case with Teoscar Hernandez. He's swinging and missing at more than half of the uh, four seamers that he swings at. Uh, Along with that, just quality of contact has gone down. His sweet spot rate has gone from 37% before the span to 20% in this span and out of 280 hitters with 25 plus batted balls in this span his sweet spot rate is ninth lowest also his ground ball rate has gone from 41 percent 
to 62%. And out of 280 hitters, his ground ball rate is eighth highest. Uh, his fly ball rate has also gone from 28% to 20%. And his barrel rate has gone from 15% before the span to 7% in the span. Uh, so nothing really going right for Teoscar Hernandez. He uh, gets, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of offensive success from his power, but is hitting more ground balls as well as less fly balls and less barrels uh, while also swinging and missing at the highest rate in baseball. So nothing really going right for Teoscar Hernandez. He is getting a slightly alarming. Um, all right. Now we will. Um, and, and yeah, now for the, yeah, the last time. It is yeah. a preview of the weekend ahead. Um, it's it's pretty obvious at this point in the year what you should be watching. Yeah. Uh, you know, typically I talk, I highlight the series to highlight. Daniel highlights the day by day pitching matchups, which are which are still, um, you know, those are less obvious. Like you don't know exactly who's who's going against who. But as far as series to watch, yeah, just just watch any anyone who's competing. Check out the Cubs, Marlins, Rangers, Mariners. Uh. Astros, Diamondbacks, Diamondbacks, Diamondbacks. Rays, like, Blue Jays. Yeah, just check out those series. Those, you know, I'm I'm gonna have my eyes glued to them. Um. So yeah. Uh. What do you got for day by day pitching matchups? Yeah. So I'm just gonna go through the games that have playoff implications today on Saturday. Uh. In Rays, Blue Jays at Rogers Center, it will be Sean Armstrong versus Hyunjin Ryu. Blue Jays obviously need to win one game to be in. Uh, I believe that's what it is, but you know the Blue Jays are playing for a lot more than the Rays are because the Rays have already clinched the fourth seed. Uh, JT Chajwa will be going for the Marlins today against the Pirates. That is at PNC Park. Uh, they they are winning in. It's simple, just winning in, um, and that's that's all it is there. Uh, Jordan Wicks and Eric Lauer will face each other in Cubs Brewers today. That game starts at 7 p.m. Eastern time at American Family Field. Um, so the the Cubs need to win. Uh, the Brewers can eliminate a division rival with a win. They've already clinched the three seed, so they're not playing for anything other than to spoil, play spoiler for the Cubs. Um, Connor Phillips and Drew Rahm will face each other in Reds-Cardinals. The Reds desperately need to win. The Cardinals could play spoiler for a division rival with a win. Um, Andrew Heaney and Luis Castillo are facing each other in Rangers-Mariners. That one obviously has a lot of implications where you know the Rangers need to win to clinch a playoff spot. The Mariners need to win to stay in the race and hope the Astros lose. And speaking of the Astros, uh, match of the night comes from Astros and Diamondbacks. Like I mentioned earlier, it's Justin Verlander versus Merrill Kelly. The Diamondbacks need to win to get into the playoffs. The Astros need to win to get into the playoffs. Um, maybe the maybe the best matchup in terms of both teams are playing to keep their season alive because the Rangers can afford to lose today and still make the playoffs, but Diamondbacks and Astros have a little less limbo right now. Yeah, absolutely. So then on uh, Sunday, it is the last day of the season. The Marlins have yet to announce their starter against the Pirates. The Rays and Blue Jays have yet to announce their starters. The Astros and Diamondbacks have yet to announce their starters. The Rangers have yet to announce their starter. George Kirby will be going for the Mariners uh, because regardless of what happens today, you know, tonight, Sunday is a day that the Mariners are going to need to win. So, you know, they got to have one of their guys out there, no doubt. Um, none, none of the other playoff hopefuls. I guess Justin Steele and Adrian Hauser is a good matchup to watch in Cubs-Brewers. It might not end up mattering, but it could. Uh, and then Hunter Green and Miles Michaelis will face each other in Reds Cardinals. Uh, so that's another one if the Reds can survive another day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, who, yeah, who, who the heck knows at this point? Anything, yep. anything is possible for sure. Um, and yeah, that does it for this installment of Above Replacement Radio. We hope you enjoyed this one and. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and want to watch the conversation as it happens, go to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, it is called Above Replacement Radio. Check out all the extra stuff, the shorts, the playlists, guest interviews, baseball history series, um, which is timeless. Also, uh, and if you're listening on YouTube and want to you know, check out the audio only streams, go to Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We are on both um, called the same thing, Above Replacement Radio. And... If you want to follow us on social media, follow me on Twitter at Chris underscore Gianta. Follow Daniel on both Twitter and Instagram at Daniel underscore Kern and follow the show Instagram at Above Replacement Radio for all the show needs. We hope you enjoyed this one and we hope to see you next time where we will be previewing the wild card matchups and uh, reviewing the regular season and what happened over the past couple days. So yep. we will see you then. This conversation. This conversation is over. Is over.